1990. And uh, I was there at church Sabbath morning. I don't remember what the pastor spoke about, but I remember that he made an altar call at the end of the service. And I, like maybe some of you, I was sitting on the edge of my seat, feeling compelled to get up and go forward, and yet being scared half to death to get out of my pew. Finally, I made the move. I got up out of my pew. I walked down to the front and uh, gave my heart to Jesus and started Bible studies to follow him in baptism. And it was an exciting day. Well, over the, next course, uh, over the course of the next few months, uh, we did Bible studies. Actually, the very same book that I use today with young people. It's kind of wild, but it's good stuff. And uh, <clears throat> in the summer of 1990, we attended the general conference session of Seventh-day Adventists in Indianapolis, Indiana. Uh, our family had the opportunity to sing the very first Sabbath uh, in between Sabbath school and church. It was kind of a fun experience, you know, being in front of 30,000 people. That's a little weird. It seems really scary, but you can't see anybody, so it's really not that big a deal. Um, had a good time there. My grandparents were there with us, and they came back with us to Arkansas. My parents had written a song for my baptism. Grandpa baptized me. It was a high day. Went home and had a meal with the family. And that afternoon, my aunt, my uncle-to-be, and I and some others went on a, on a hike. Went and found this plot of woods and went hiking. It's property actually that ended up becoming my grandfather's property. But we walked down this little dirt path down through the woods. And, and as we were walking, it began to sprinkle on us. We continued walking and it became a rain. And we got to the bluff, and this wasn't like a 10-foot little bluff. It was probably 100, 120 feet. And it was angled, so we kind of slid and stumbled our way down to the bottom. We needed to get back to the vehicle. And by the time we got to the bottom of the bluff, we were so wet that crossing the creek at the bottom didn't really matter anymore. We just sloshed on through it. Finally got back to the vehicle and headed back home. And so since that day, I've always kind of joked about it as being the day I was baptized twice. Once in the baptistry, and once in the woods. You all probably remember the day that you were baptized as well. Maybe there were special friends or family there. Maybe it was a special service. Maybe it was in a creek or a river or a lake. Maybe the ocean. Maybe some other configuration. There were special things that happened that day that you most likely remember. Baptism is like a second birthday. It's our spiritual birthday. The Bible uh, talks about baptism quite a bit. And there's a question that I have to ask when it comes to baptism. As you think about your baptism, what was that baptism about? Was it just about going up in one of these things or a body of water and getting wet? Or was there something more to it? Today we're going to take a look at what Paul has to say about baptism. Let's pray together. Father in heaven, we invite your spirit to be here just now. Open our hearts and minds, we pray. In Jesus' name, amen. Open your Bibles with me this morning to Romans chapter 6. Oh, there's a little sentimental picture for you. So into telling the story, I forgot to show the picture. A little uh, thing my mom put together uh, that I had to go dig out of the boxes this morning. That was my baptism day in 1990. I'm so little, I know. Special, special day. Romans chapter 6. Six. Up to this point in the book of Romans, Paul has clearly pointed out the condition of humanity. And it's pretty dismal. There's no good about it. We're all sinners and all our righteousness is short of what is required for salvation. No matter how hard we try, we are unable to overcome sin. He says in chapter 5, verse 20, just a couple verses uh, before 6, he says, Moreover, the law entered that the offense might abound, but where sin abounded, grace abounded much more. So the picture even gets worse. He says, Law came and now we were all in big trouble. But he gives us hope. Though sin abounded, though the law made it abound even more, God's grace is greater than the sin that came up. There was hope for us. He introduces hope. Then Paul asks a question in Romans 6 verse 1. He says, what shall we say then? Shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? Now, if you're logically thinking about it, well, if there's a lot of sin, then there's even more grace. So let's sin more so there will be more grace. It almost sounds as though Paul is giving us license to sin. 
Mm -mm. Oh, that sounds a little scary, doesn't it? Well, that's good. It should. Because that's not, of course, what he's saying. Vincent, in his commentary, uh, the word studies in New, the New Testament, states that the use of this phrase points to Paul's training in the rabbinical schools, where questions are propounded and the students encouraged to debate objections being suddenly interposed and answered. So this statement that Paul makes here in verse 1, this is just common rhetoric for those who have been rabbinically trained. He's just simply talking the way he should be. I mean, in English class, you learned how to write a letter, right? You have your opening, you have the body, you have a conclusion. There's a certain way to do it. You don't want to do those things out of order. It's not proper. That's exactly what Paul is doing here in Romans 6. He knows how this conversation is supposed to go, and he's simply elaborating that way. So he starts with this question. And there's one particular word here in this verse that we need to look at a little more closely. It's that word sin. Just a little, small, inconspicuous word there. But it's important. K.S. Woost points out in his commentary on, uh, on Greek in the New Testament, he says regarding that word, the first thing we must settle in is regarding the word sin. Does it refer here to sin as an abstraction, namely to acts of sin committed by the believer, or to the totally depraved nature still in him? Okay, do you see what he's saying here? Is sin all those little actions that we do? Or is sin this bigger thing, this, this tendency of the life, this trajectory of the life? Woos continues, he says it's a rule of, uh, or he says a rule of Greek syntax settles the question. The definite article appears before the word in the Greek text. So it's not just sin, but it's the sin. Um, here the article points back to a previously mentioned sin defined in its context. The reference is to sin reigning as king in chapter 5, verse 21. There, sin is personified since it reigns as a king. But one cannot conceive of acts of sin reigning as king in the life of a person. They are the result of some dominant factor reigning as a king. So it's not all those actions that we're talking about, but it's something greater than those actions, where those actions come from. There's something greater acting as king of the life. That can only be the evil nature still resident in the Christian. And here's the key to the interpretation of the entire chapter. In time, the word sin is, uh, every time the word sin is used in this chapter as a noun, it refers to the evil nature in the Christian. Okay? So we're not talking about all the little actions, but the evil nature. R.J. Utley would agree, he states that the term sin seems to refer to our sin nature inherited from Adam. Now this is an important point. We may think that living a perfect life means we never have any of these little sins. We never make mistakes, right? Because we're called to live a holy life. Now if we're talking about all those little sins, that's all those little pinpoints and living without those is impossible. However, this comment suggests something otherwise, that it's not just all those little things, but rather it's the tendency of life. It's the nature with which we look at life from. Woos continues, he says, The question now can be further interpreted to mean, shall we continue habitually to sustain the same relationship to the sinful nature that we sustained before we were saved? a relationship which was most cordial, a relationship in which we were fully yielded to and dependent upon that sinful nature. And all this as a habit of life. So here, uh, Woos is saying there's a change here from before we were with Christ to now that we've accepted Christ. When we accept Christ into our lives, our relationship with sin changes. We have chosen a new Lord of our lives. We no longer are bound or have a close relationship with sin. It's like when you were back in high school and you know there was that special boy or that special girl. You know, you were just friends for a while and then that relationship changed. And then eventually the relationship you had with a boyfriend or girlfriend changed again and became a marriage. Now, in a marriage things are different than with friends. The relationship changes. Our relationship with sin was once cordial. That's what we embraced. We loved our sinful habits. But when we accept Christ, that relationship changes. We look at sin a little differently now. We've changed masters in our life. 
Now let's go back to Paul's argument of sinning to receive grace. If, let's say, on your way to church this morning, you saw this. All right? You were driving a little too quickly in that slower area, and you got pulled over. So you turn on your right blinker, you slowly move to the side of the road, you stop, you roll your window down, you're very polite to the officer who informs you that your speedometer is broken. The officer tells you what your correct speed was that you were completely oblivious to. And he asks for your license, your registration, he goes back to the car, and then afterwards he comes back and he says, well, <clears throat> today I'm going to give you a warning. You need to make sure you drive slower. You say, thank you so much. You roll up your window, you put your things away, you turn on your left blinker, and you lay a black strip right there on the road. Right? That's how you do it. Right? No. Your relationship has changed to the law. You've experienced grace. You now behave differently. You put on your left blinker, you look in your rearview mirror, you slowly accelerate to three miles an hour below the speed limit, and you continue on your way to church. Your relationship with the law has changed because of your interaction with the law. When we accept Christ, our relationship with sin changes. We no longer espouse it. We no longer enjoy it. We no longer participate in it on a regular basis. We have now changed in that relationship. So when Christ has forgiven our sin condition, should we continue in sin so he will forgive us again? Ooh, maybe I need to go back over this part again. <laughs> no, that's exactly what Paul says. He says, certainly not. He answers his own question. And then he continues in verse 2 and says, How shall we who died to sin continue any longer in it? He says, you need to change. The relationship has changed. It's a good point, especially in light of sin being a sinful nature that we have inherited. It changes our relationship to sin. Because Christ died for us, he paid the price for our sin condition. And when we accept him, it changes everything. Paul writes in 2 Corinthians 5.21, For he made him, that's Jesus, who knew no sin, to be sin for us, that we might become the righteousness of God in him. He changed the sin condition that we are helpless to change. But when we accept him, that situation changes. And then in 1 Peter 2.24, we read, Who himself bore our sins in his own body on the tree, that we, having died to sins, might live for righteousness by whose stripes you were healed. Because Jesus died for you and I, therefore we should not continue to live according to our sinful nature. This last week, as we were doing the kids' Sabbath school lesson, uh, there's this discussion about a, a wedding feast. And uh, the, the master of the house comes in and finds someone in the wedding feast that doesn't have on the wedding garment. And he goes to the man and says, well, what's going on? Why don't you have on the garment that I gave you? Well, blah, 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 blah. There's no excuse. When we accept Jesus, we accept that wedding garment, that robe of righteousness to cover up our sin. That sin condition has changed. Our relationship with sin is different now. Jesus paid the price, and we're living a different life now. Paul then continues his argument in verse 3. He says, Or do you not know that as many of us as were baptized into Christ Jesus were baptized into his death? Well, now wait a second baptized into death that sounds weird what in the world is paul talking about here well utley tells us that the use of ace which is the the preposition in or into it parallels the great commission of matthew 28 19 where new believers are baptized ace or into the name of the father and the son and the holy spirit so we are baptized into the likeness of god so when we are baptized into death we symbolically die. All right? We symbolically die. And what do we die to? Well, we die to the way things used to be. Sinful nature. When we are baptized, we are joined to Christ. We lose identity in self, and we now find our identity in Christ. We take on another's name. Now, ladies, some of you here this morning have done this very thing very physically in this life, right? When you married your husband, 
you probably took his name. You changed names. Your identity is no longer in your mom and dad necessarily, but in the new family that you've created, the name that you've taken on. So it is for Christians. Instead of, hello, my name is Chris, I'm a sinner. It is now, hello, my name is Chris, I am a son of the king of the universe. That's a good change to make, isn't it? It's a new identity that we have. Galatians chapter 2, verse 20. I have been crucified with Christ. It is no longer I who live, but Christ lives in me. And the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. It is a change of identity. It's no longer about me. It's all about him. This changes everything. You know, we talk about stewardship, and where does our mind go? Money. But friends, if we've put on Christ, if we've taken on a new name, stewardship is about everything that we do. From every moment, from the very moment we wake up to the moment we go to sleep, all the time that we spend throughout the day, we are using, we are stewarding, because it is a gift of God. Stewardship involves all that we do. And when we take on this new identity, the identity of Christ, all that we do represents him. Therefore, we are his stewards. We relinquish control of our lives to someone else, someone who knows us better than we know ourselves. We are now in relationship with Christ. It is a new, deeper union with him. In Galatians 3.27, Paul writes, For as many of you as were baptized into Christ have put on Christ. So everything changes at the moment of baptism, right? It's like a trick question, isn't it? A.T. Robertson states, Baptism is the public proclamation of one's inward spiritual relationship or relation to Christ attained before baptism. The baptism. So Selena and Jacob didn't change the moment they entered the water. The change already took place. This is simply the public affirmation that this is the change that has taken place in my life. It is a symbol of what has taken place already. It is the change in one's life. Paul continues in verse 4. Romans 6, he says, Therefore we were buried with him through baptism into death, that just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so we also should walk in newness of life. Paul says that we are buried with Christ. We must remember who Paul is talking to. We were buried. He is talking to Roman Christians. They've already been baptized. They've already given their hearts to Jesus. So he says, you were buried And how are we to be buried with him? Must we physically go into the ground with him? Do we need to take a pilgrimage today and go to Israel and to go to the garden tomb and walk and be in that place so we can physically be buried with him? No, of course not. We are symbolically buried with Christ in the waters of baptism. That's why Selena had to face her fear and go all the way under the water this morning. Because we have to completely die to self. Our fears, our sinful tendencies, all that has to be put to rest. We go completely under the water just as Christ was buried in the earth. Just as Jesus' physical life was laid in the ground in baptism, we are completely under the water, symbolizing complete spiritual death to the old ways of living. Paul says, you have been baptized, you have been buried with him. Now, in case you get the feeling that baptism is a real downer, it's just all about death, that's not the case. Baptism is just as much about the resurrection and new life as it is about burying the old way of life. Baptism is is two-directional in its symbolism. It is death to the old life, and it is birth in new life, new spiritual life. Because you see, when you die to one thing, something else must take its place. Robertson suggests that the picture in baptism points two ways. Backwards to Christ's death and burial and to our death to sin. 
and forwards in Christ's resurrection from the dead and to our new life pledged by coming out of the watery grave to walk on the other side of the baptismal grave. Paul talks about Jesus' resurrection. He suggests that we are to be resurrected and to walk in newness of life. That term walk here, it implies habitual conduct. Just like sin was a habitual uh, way of living, now we're supposed to have a new way of living every single day. Everything changes when we commit our lives to Jesus. Our desires, our practices, our habits, everything. The direction of our life makes an about face. And there are some of you here who maybe have made a decision to follow Jesus later in life, and you can testify to this very thing. You once lived life a certain way, walking according to the desires of the flesh, that sinful condition. But when you accepted Jesus, things changed, maybe imperceptibly, but as you get down the road a little ways and look back, you say, wow, I can't believe I did that. There is a change of life. It is an about face from walking this way in my own thing to turning around and walking to Jesus and what he wants for me because it is absolutely polar opposite of what I want for myself. Wu suggests that the Holy Spirit at the time of the sinner's salvation enthroned the Lord Jesus in the throne room of the believer's heart. He stays on the throne so long as the believer keeps yielded to the Spirit and rejects the behests of the evil nature. When the believer sins, the dethroned king, the evil nature, mounts to the throne with the consequent dethronement of the Lord Jesus. Now, to make this a little simpler and for kids... Uh, kids, have you ever played um, King of the Mountain? Ah, <laughs> yeah, you know what that game is, right? So, so for those of you who may not know what King of the Mountain is, <clears throat> there's a hill or a chair or a beanbag or several mattresses or whatever it is, some higher point. And the object is to stay on top of the higher point, not to get knocked off. So once you get to that pinnacle, then you have attacks from every direction of people trying to knock you off so they can get to the top. In a spiritual sense, that is what is going on in our life between God and Satan. And the choice is up to you of who gets the top spot. They can't knock each other off necessarily. That is your choice. When we accept Jesus, we place him on top. He is the king of the mountain. And when we choose to follow Satan, what we say is, God, nope, don't want you there. Get out of the way. Satan, you go ahead and take that spot. That's what happens. And so there's this constant battle going on in our lives. So this new life that we're resurrected into, it is a constant battle. It's not a one and done situation. It's a continual battle against the desires of the flesh, the evil nature. Paul talks about it in Romans chapter 7. He says, I know what is right. I know what I want to do, but I can't do it. It's the things that I don't want to do that I end up doing. He recognizes this ongoing battle that happens each and every day of our lives. Even though one has died to the old man, the old way of living, there is still a battle that goes on. Like our children's story this morning, that, that old desire, that evil ghost keeps trying to rear its ugly head, tries to continue to destroy us. And it's only through the death to self and the resurrection to new life that we have any hope in this battle against Satan. Now, the word life that uh, Paul uses here in Romans is a little interesting. The common word for the um, term life is bios. It talks about the manner of life. But Paul uses the word zoe. It's the principle of life. The SEA commentary points out that to walk in newness of life is to, is to walk after the spirit, the principle, following the spirit. Hence, the daily conduct of the Christian will reveal the presence and effect of the spirit of life. When we have changed sides, when we've changed our allegiance, the principle of our life is different. Yeah, we may fall, we may make mistakes, but the principle where we are headed, it has changed directions. This new life is found in none other than Jesus Christ. When we give up our old sinful ways, we must keep on living life, but in a new way, to a new master. Paul continues his discussion in verse 5. He says, For if we have been united together in the likeness of his death, certainly we also shall be in the likeness of his resurrection. Now this idea of united, being united in this new way of life, brings about another, another thought to mind. A story that we read in Genesis chapter 
2. There, God created a man and a woman. And in Genesis 2.24, we read, Therefore a man shall leave his father and mother and be joined to his wife, and they shall become one flesh. They become a new entity. They are united together and become something different than what was before. The same is true when we unite ourselves with Christ. Our life changes. It becomes something different than what it was before. Jesus taught the same concept in John chapter 15. He talks about a vine and some branches. He refers to himself as the vine. And as long as we as the branches remain connected, we will produce fruit. We will live. We will continue. Those grapes are rocking the screen, I guess. I don't know what's going on back there. It's the fan. Ah, well, I don't know. Anyhow, um, when we are connected to Christ, we will receive newness of life. We will, we will be changed. Paul then continues in verse 6. He says, Knowing this, that our old man was crucified with him, that the body of sin might be done away with, that we should no longer be slaves of sin. The old man that Paul refers to here is representative of our old way of doing things, the previous habits, our lifestyle. In Ephesians 4.22 and 23 says that you put off concerning your former conduct the old man which grows corrupt according to deceitful lusts and be renewed in the spirit of your mind. Paul says here you have changed. That is the old way of living life, the old way of doing things. Then in Colossians 3.9 he says do not lie to one another since you have put off the old man and his deeds. You've changed. Something has changed. Don't do that stuff anymore. Now Jesus, he says the exact same thing as Paul's saying here. He just uses a little different terminology. Jesus taught that we need to be reborn. There was a particular man one evening that came to Jesus. He was a, a ruler in Israel and, and he came to Jesus at night because he was a little concerned about what others might say about him if he went during the day. And so this man named Nicodemus comes to Jesus and he says, Hey, we know you're a teacher, you're a man of God. Um, that's wonderful. Jesus cuts the chase. He sees right into Nicodemus' heart. He says, you know what? You need to be reborn. What? And then Nicodemus, you know, either he was really stupid or he just played stupid. He said, well, can I go back into my mother's womb? Now, I would hope that he was just being stupid and he wasn't actually stupid. He was a very trained man. He knew better than that. He was trying to bluff. He was trying to, trying to pat around the answer. He, he didn't want to admit what Jesus was saying. But Jesus said, no, you need to be reborn. And in John 3, 5, Jesus said that one must be born of water and the Spirit to enter the kingdom of heaven. Just like that. It's quiet. So in John 3, 5, Jesus said that one must be born of water and the Spirit to enter the kingdom of heaven. Then Jesus says in Mark 16, 16, one must repent and be baptized to be saved. So we have to put our old man to death in the waters of baptism. Our sinful lifestyle must be put to death. We must be raised into new life in Christ. And this thing called baptism, it's something that each one of us must choose to participate in. The Seventh-day Adventist commentary points out that in order for the sacrifice of Christ to accomplish salvation for the sinner, the individual believer must knowingly participate in the meaning and in the experience represented by the death, burial, and resurrection of Christ for his sake. It's something that we must choose. It's not chosen for us. We make that decision personally. Today, Selena and Jacob make the decision for baptism, not because mom and dad said, oh, you have to be baptized now. At least I hope that's not it. <laughs> They made that decision because they love Jesus and they want to follow. Jacob, you realized you don't have to be perfect. God still loves you. Selena, you know Jesus is by your side. He'll help you overcome your fears. And as long as we continue to accept him, have that new vision for life, we're headed in the right direction. We have to make that choice to follow him. The commentary continues, it is the intelligent participation in the meaning of the symbolism that brings to the believer the blessing that was intended. He meditates upon each step in the process and thinks to himself, now I am entering into fellowship with Christ in his death. As I am immersed, I am being buried with Christ. As I emerge from the water, I am rising to new life in Christ. 
The ceremony is thus no empty outward form, but a confirming and transforming experience that is ever remembered as symbolic of the end of the old life of sin and the beginning of the new life of righteousness in union with Christ. You see, the baptism isn't an empty form. It's not just a ceremony that we go through. It has deep, deep meaning. It has to do with our death to self and our being reborn in Christ. We must also realize that baptism does not save us. Baptism does not save us. If baptism saved us, we would have no need of Christ. Because we could do something to save ourselves. Baptism will not save you. Now Jesus did say, be baptized and you will be saved, right? But baptism cannot save us. We are saved by the grace of Jesus Christ. It is none of our work that will save us. It is only because of his grace. Utley suggests, baptism was not the mechanism of forgiveness, salvation, or the coming of the Spirit but the occasion for their public profession and confession. Baptism is simply the symbol indicating what has already taken place in our lives. It is not what saves us. He also states, our new life does not bring us salvation, but it is the result of salvation. Baptism is the symbol of what has already happened in our lives, not the event that allows these things to happen. It is in baptism that we truly celebrate what Christ has done for us. As we conclude this morning, I want you to remember what your baptism was about. It wasn't about a special day or a special speaker. It wasn't about your family. It wasn't even being in the baptismal font. Your baptism is about identifying in your new life in Christ. Saying goodbye to the old turning around, going another direction with your life, allowing Christ to be number one in all that you do and all that you say. It's about identifying with Christ. It's about surrender of your life to Him. That is what our baptism is all about. There in Mark 16, 16, Jesus says, Repent and be baptized, and you will be saved. We also read that you need to be baptized of the water and the Spirit. 